can you all hear me well? Yeah, great. Okay. So, once upon a time, there was a man who possessed a ring of a great value. The ring had the power to make its wearer beloved of God and man. The man had three sons, but could not decide to whom of them he would pass on the ring. So he asked a jeweler to produce two copies of the ring that would look precisely the same as the original one. But after his death, the sons ended up in a dispute over the authenticity of their respective rings. To settle their conflict, they went to a judge. After assessing the situation and knowing the ring's miraculous value, the judge pronounced his conclusion. You tell me that the real ring enjoys the hidden power to make the wearer of God and man beloved. Let that decide. Which of you do two brothers love the best? You're silent. Do these love exciting rings act in part only, not without? Does each love but himself? You're all deceived deceivers. None of your rings is true. The real ring perhaps is gone. To hide or to supply its loss, your father ordered the th three rings for one. If each of you has had a ring presented by his father, let each believe his own the real ring. It is possible the, fa it's possible the father chose no longer to tolerate the one ring's tyranny, and certainly, as he much loved you all, and loved you all alike, it could not please him, to fa by favoring one, to be of two the oppressor. Let each feel honored by this free affection, unworked by prejudice, let each endeavor to vie with both his brothers in displaying the virtue of his ring, assist its might with gentleness, benevolence, forbearance, with inward resignation to the godhood. And if the virtues of this ring continue to show themselves among your children's children after thousand thousand years, be uh, then appear before this judgment seat, and a greater one shall sit upon it and decide. The story of the Three Rings is part of a play, Nathan the Wise, written in the 18th century by the German playwright and Enlightenment philosopher Gotthold Ephraim Lessing. The story is set in the 12th century Jerusalem, which then, and still after almost a millennium, serves as a setting for the struggles between the three biggest monotheistic religions of the world. So what does this story tell us? It contains crucial points for the topic of our panel that we can derive from the judge's work, judge words. As the Islamic studies professor, Syed Hussein Nasser, has pointed out in his book, Heart of Islam, I quote, the multiplicity of races, nations, and tribes necessitates the diversity of revelations. Therefore, the divine will that we have to consider is by way of example demonstrated in the Quranic verse. If Allah had willed, he would have made you one nation, but he may test you in what he has given you, so compete in good deeds. Thus, apart from religious relativism, the story tells us to also consider God's command to us and the judge's command to the three brothers to embed our coexistence in good deeds and virtues we share. Some interpret the three rings in terms of religious tolerance. But I want to rather emphasize the relationship between the three brothers and thus approach our topic of equality, inclusiveness, and non-discrimination by discussing and examining critically some aspects of our societal lives. As I seek an answer to the question, what is it, what is, what is it that drives us to disregard the mutual respect, the mutual bonds we have with our fellow humans, but to otherize them as our opposition? I will draw examples from the relationships between Muslims and non-Muslims and also tackle issues of identity and culture. Bishop Rowan D. Williams noted in his speech, I quote, Christianity and Islam, and indeed Judaism as well, are part of a long family, family quarrel within the family of the children of Abraham. It can be bitter at times, but as with family quarrels, there remains a great deal of territory that you still occupy together in the house. The essence of this common ter territory can in our everyday lives be defined by a sum of multiple aspects that are in play when we are supposed to share a social space with those of whom we, like the three brothers, perceive as the adversary other. 
As my home country, Finland, as many other European countries at this moment, is receiving an increased number of refugees from Syria, Iraq and elsewhere, the public discourse is in many cases characterized by the fear of Islamization of the country by the refugees and other Muslim citizens. This idea is embedded in the thought of a creeping Sharia, which emerges from the idea of Islam as a manipulated religion, a feature of Islamophobia identified by the Runnymede Report already in the late 1990s. What strikes me the most is not the level of this plain ignorance that in my optimistic thinking can actually be overcome by education, but it is the, the deeper rooted attitudes towards these refugees and Muslims in general, supported by the argument that they are too different from the other, uh, from us. Surely there are socio-political factors in the country that drive people to this modus of self-defense and not to welcome newcomers when even the issues of it so far it is citizens are in trouble in terms of welfare and prosperity. Yet I want to point out that it is the micro-level social interactions which define much of that what we perceive our vis-a-vis -vis to be and that they form the sources of these perceptions and we need to investigate them more in detail. For this examination, I consider the German sociologist Alois Hahn's explanation on how fremdheit or otherness is no inherent quality of a human being, but it is a definition of a relationship. It is a label, an operation of attribution, attribution that is carried out by carried out by the attributor, attributor him or herself. Thus, we are dealing here with the social construction of the other. Hahn notes that the otherness changes according to the circumstances. This is clear when we think about civil wars. Over one night, the person you just considered your neighbor, one of us in the block, and maybe also a fellow player in the soccer team that you, you both swear loyalty to, he can become the enemy, the other opposed to whom you are mirroring your own position. Following me, Alois Hahn maintains that the social construction of the other in this sense operates within a selection of variety of criteria that are based on commonalities and differences, taken as a source for self-identification. And this self-identification functions in terms of juxtapositions. Thus, each person embodies a sum of identity that we use in different settings to position ourselves in the social space we are located in. These identities are needed in many aspects of our lives. For example, my religious identity gives me an answer for existential questions. And as the liberal thinker of Will Kimlicka has argued, in the case of multicultural citizenship, national identities serve as a fundamental focus of identification since they offer a strong sense of belonging. So in these post-normal times we live in, surrounded by uncertainties, my national identity gives me a sense of stability. Yet the problem for the discussion about inclusiveness and non-discrimination of Muslims in European societies lies in the modus operandi in the social construction of the other, or self-identification. This becomes detrimental when its dynamics are inflexible and unidirectional. When only one component of a person's identity is taken as, a, as determinant, when commonalities are being pushed aside as ne negligible, even though so far they have been functioning, or they could be doing so, a strong aspect of unification. So when do we stick to the commonalities, and when do we let the differences dominate? If two people can feel unified by their profession, for instance in the setting of a worker association meeting, does the feeling of this solidarity have to disappear when they are sitting on the opposite sides of a stadium in a soccer game? Our, ex our example of the three brothers shows how easily this can happen. Their obsession with the authenticity of their rings drove them to disregard even one of the strongest bonds humans can have, brotherhood by blood. Similarly, what happens in Finland and in other European countries at the moment regarding the relation in which Muslims are seen can be analyzed in this framework. In public discourse, when Muslims are excluded from the societal us, they are being defined only through their religious affiliation, and thus the category of the other is stamped on their foreheads like passports at a border control desk. Muslim writers dealing with Islam in European societies, such as Navid Kermani and Tariq Ramadan, have recognized the difficulties that this kind of forced reduction of our naturally hybrid identities brings along, 
When suddenly a person is forced to problematize and think about an identity she or he has so far taken for granted. Inclusiveness requires acknowledgement of a person as one of us. And as Germani has argued, the price that we Muslims pay when being pushed into dichotomies would be to belong only to that category one is ascribed to by an outside force and to dissociate with the other. So definitions shape the world we live in. But it is eminent to understand that more dangerous than definitions, it is the power to define. As I noted before, our identities are hybrid, and very rarely they work isolated from each other. So if I was to be labeled as the other only by my Muslimness, I would object to that. I object, firstly, because I will not do the favor for the attributors and be defined only by my Muslimness, because then it would be too easy to exclude me from the Finnish us as being the other. Secondly, to define a person only in terms of a single identity, it cannot and it will not tell everything about a person. So if anyone should see me only as a Muslim, he most probably would not find out or even regard that I am a fan of metal music, I would describe myself as a nature lover, and that my family stems, as is the case with many other Finns, from the eastern part of Finland, Karelia. All of this and many other things is for me what makes me a Finn. And yes, at the same time, I am a Muslim. So it is a crucial to note that different dimensions of my persona and our personas do not contradict the others. When the discourse circulates around the question whether or not Islam and Muslims are compatible with the Finnish culture, I then wonder what kind of a Finnish culture are we talking about? Is it the citizenship as such? which is easily proven for the most? Is it supporting the Finnish national teams in ski jumping and ice hockey? Is it the black rye bread that we miss while being abroad? Is it the midsummer night that we celebrate? Is it our frumpy mentality? Or is it maybe the Finnish sauna? I also wonder about which Islam and who the Muslims are we talking about? Islam, as any other religions, is not a monolith or an isolated entity from its surroundings. It has been, and it is, constantly in contact with the local cultures. And Muslims? Well, we just need to look at the many Muslim personalities we encounter in this conference, and we will see how diverse we are. So when it comes to the integration of the Muslims in the Finnish or other European societies, we can consider what the former Grand Mufti of Bosnia Herzegovina, Mustafa Ceric, in his speech about the Muslim social contract, advocated about the integrative role of Muslims in Europe. The Muslims should not be passive bystanders and watch the world go by, but actively participate in the affairs of our respective societies. This is because we are firstly bound by God's covenant to balance the transcendental and the present, but also we are subjects of the society in the sense of a social contract. It is right that in the realm of the covenant, the fundamental pillar, pillars of our religion are non-negotiable. Yet, the confession, the prayer, the mandatory charity, the pilgrimage to Mecca, and fasting in Ramana, Ramadan, these are hardly in conflict with being included when it comes to the matters of the society. And what remains of our religious practices to decide upon ourselves, our inner faith, our relationship with the Creator, leaves room for individual choices and creates this diversity we witness. So while being Muslims, we can still participate in the society, and we do. For instance, we contribute to the intellect at the universities, we participate in the politics, we go to the military service, we push the country's economy and science forward, run restaurants serving international cuisine, pay taxes as we work, as nurses, and so forth. However, even though we try, and we do try hard, we are just not quite there yet. So this is at least what the discourse lets us feel. We are not part of the societal or the cultural us. What else is there then to do? When are we in that space and time when the Muslim citizen is acknowledged as being equal to the non-Muslim one? When does the social construction of the other in this respect finally end? For that, I cannot provide an ultimate answer. But at least for the purpose of this G20 Interface Summit, as we are gathered here, with the diversity in terms of our cultural and religious backgrounds, I challenge all of you, dear participants of this conference, to encounter the people you will discuss here with through an open mind. 
do not see each other based on oppositions, the differences you have in terms of your identities, be it then your sex, your religion, your ethnicity, academic positions, or something else. Rather, go for a quest after the commonalities, the territory you share, and what is important to you. That what brings you together in mutual understanding of your interests, of your beliefs and goals, and create a feeling of solidarity. For this, let us be us. Thank you.